One of the neat things about uh, utopian or dystopian literature, and utopian inevitably ends up being, if you ask me, <laughs> dystopian literature, uh, is the fact that there's a presupposition in every one of these dystopian slash utopian science fiction novels, I guess you'd call them, where a decision was made uh, that humanity was either going to be perfected or improved using somewhat radical means, and the radical means or controversial means or explosive or um, revolutionary means create either unintended consequences or backfires or is shown to have been a corrupt conspiracy from the beginning, a manipulation. And <clears throat> generally the thrust of most of the dystopian stuff is don't tamper with Mother Nature. Um, it's an interesting knee-jerk response that we have, and I think that I understand why. If you look at um, the wars of the 20th century and the genocides and everything and totalitarianism and all that sort of thing. It's when people were experimenting, if you ask me, mixing things like eugenics or social sciences or uh, human engineering with totalitarian politics, and we see the result. You've got Nazi Germany, Stalinist Russia, that kind of thing. Um, it's bred in us a fear of any attempt to create a utopian a utopia, a utopian society. I think that's a legitimate fear, but I don't think we can use that excuse indefinitely. <laughs> uh, the technology is going to be there a lot sooner than we think. It's advancing exponentially, I guess. Uh, and you can't put off questions like, what kind of people should there be forever? <laughs> um, I'd like to see how on earth we would build a consensus as a society. We've tried dictatorship plus uh, attempts to perfect society or make it as imperfect as possible. We see where that's led us. They inevitably the thinking is, well, before we can get to work on building the wonderful new society, we have to purge ourselves of the bad old stuff. Uh, <laughs> yeah, World War Two and the killing fields of Chung Ek in Cambodia later, <clears throat> we realize that that becomes kind of an end in itself after a while, human beings being what they are. But again, the objections don't really fundamentally thwart the question, what kind of people should there be? It doesn't... Uh, there's plenty of cautionary uh, tales here about what not to do, and we've certainly uh, filled our heads with ideas of what we don't want again. We don't want to bring back... Uh, Stalin or Hitler or any of these people. Um, but at, at best, that kind of aversion is only buying us some time. The question will arise. <laughs> what kind of people should there be? And how do we decide? That might be the biggest question facing us, and we're, we may not be facing it. <laughs> I love that topic. It's the Pandora's box is open, and we've got to face the possibilities of altering our fundamental nature. How do we go about that, and why should we do it? What should be our motive for it? People don't think, I, uh, rather, I think that people don't want to face this, this question, because of the implications. Um... We're going to have to face it whether we like it or not. <laughs>